All right. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Micah, and we're going to be talking about WordPress security today. Um, if you have questions, feel free to post them in the chat. Um, I think we'll uh, we'll try to try to answer questions as they come in. Um, also, I think do we have the hand raise feature or anything like that here? Um, you can you can yes, unmute and ask questions do. as well. Yeah. So yeah, if you have the the hand raise feature, um, I'll try to. There's a lot to pay attention to <laughs> while, while I'm trying to talk and go through slides, but um, definitely try to try to pay attention to all those things. So, um, <clears throat> but yeah, so I want to kind of walk through some of the security uh, aspects of WordPress, and um, I've been using WordPress for I think it's what 12, 13, probably more years. I haven't done the math in a while, um, and run into a lot of plenty of sites that have been hacked and uh, random situations as throughout my career. So um, a lot of this is stuff that I've, I've learned as I've gone along. Um, so well, let's just jump in. <clears throat> so obviously we wanna kinda start out the conversation by talking a little bit about what, why it's important. Uh, so there's a lot of reasons why security is important. Obviously, um, you know, information loss is a real thing, and <laughs> we see a lot more and more of that um, as time goes on. Um, so you want to definitely make sure that you take care of not just your information, but your client's information. Um, <laughs> and as a result, your reputation that goes along with that. Um, but not only that, if um, Google happens to pick up the fact that your site has been hacked or something like that, can severely impact your uh, SEO rankings and cause you to drop in the search results um, and potentially can cause financial loss as well. So a lot of things that could go wrong if you, if you don't take security seriously. And unfortunately, to be honest, I think most developers don't think about security first. They, uh, they see it as, <laughs> uh, you know, an add-on essentially, instead of a, a key thing that should be done along the way. So if you are working with developer, try to try to make sure you find somebody who does take security seriously. Um, so I want to kind of walk through just some of the different, some of the different attacks. So these are not all the attacks. These are just some common things that we see a lot. Um, and I'll do my best to try to explain these um, as simply as I can. But uh, the first is what we call a brute force attack. So a brute force attack is basically where someone um, usually using some sort of program that they've written uh, will automatically and systematically guess passwords and attempt to use them on your website over and over and over and over and over again um, until ideally they figure out your password and then they can log in. Um, and so typically the way that it starts is they say, okay, let me find someone who I am pretty sure is an admin in WordPress, right? So they're trying to find <clears throat> uh, find those people who have higher level access. So um, yeah, so we'll talk a little bit more about ways of kind of mitigating some of these things, but just want to kind of make you aware of the different types of things that do go on. So brute force attacks are usually, they run things like what they call dictionary attacks, where they just throw a bunch of words and mix them up and try different combinations and things like that. Um, so that's kind of what's going on here. And uh, a lot of web posts, for example, if, if they start to detect that there's these multiple, multiple attempts coming from the same location, uh, they'll put a stop to it. But uh, that isn't always the case. And sometimes uh, you have to find other ways of, of dealing with these. Um, so another one is something we call SQL injection. So this is where uh, typically if you have a form that's on a web page, could be like a search box or a, you know, a, you know, if you have like a, um, you know, all kinds of different forms and things. So 
typically with WordPress, if you're using a reputable forms plugin, the code is written in such a way that if someone were to try to put something malicious into one of these fields, um, it wouldn't really do anything um, to your site. Your site should be pretty secure. But um, <clears throat> but yeah, like if you have a, a theme that maybe was written by a developer who wasn't familiar with security, um, you know, it could be that when you submit the form, whatever malicious code was put into that field, it could manipulate your database. So it could inject things into your database, which then could be used to output things uh, that would compromise uh, people who are coming to your site, uh, either their information or their user logins or all kinds of stuff. So uh, <clears throat> super important that we, you know, make sure that we keep our form fields properly sanitized so that we don't run into this type of thing. Uh, another one is cross-site scripting. Um, there's, there's, it's kind of hard to describe because there's so many different ways that this could happen. Um, but ultimately it's, uh, it's about uh, being able to inject an executable script into the code of a website, which again could be through SQL injection, which we just talked about. Mm -hmm. um, and it basically allows the um, attacker to gain access, could be access to information, access to a user's uh, login, um, all kinds of stuff. So um, another one is uh, DDoS attacks. So this is called a distributed denial of service attack. And so this is basically where someone is sending a lot of, um, uh, yeah, I see some questions. So I'm going to jump back here in just a second. Um, so the DDoS attacks are when tons of requests are made to the server um, and you will essentially have, uh, if your server can't keep up, uh, you know, eventually the site will crash um, due to not enough resources to run the site. So I was going to look at a couple of questions here. So um, I saw a good one in there. Oh, yeah how and when to sanitize database. Um, so we're not gonna get too much into like the coding aspect of this. We're gonna try to keep this as, you know, we, we will go into some more like advanced things that developers will probably wanna do, but we won't necessarily be going into the exact how. Um, I do have um, a, a whole nother presentation where I talk about sanitization and escaping and uh, all those key things that you want to do when you're writing either like a plugin or theme in WordPress. Um, so if you want to go try to look that up, um, you should be able to Google Micah Wood sanitizing, escaping, and validating. <laughs> it should turn up something. Um, if it doesn't, you can always reach out to me through wpscholar.com contact form, and I'll get you that if you want it. Um, but yeah, so another question here, how might one be able to determine if their site was hacked? What does it look like? So actually, yeah, that's future slide. So we'll wait on that one for a second. Um, so kind of the last one here uh, is another big group we call malware. Uh, so this is where, again, someone's able to install something on your site and um, it's used to do malicious things, right? Uh, so it might be redirecting people who are coming to your site to purchase Viagra. <laughs> uh, it could be, um, you know, they're actually in, inserting ads for random things on your site. Um, and, you know, they may be just trying to get you blacklisted on Google so that they potentially being the competition can rank higher or something like that. Um, or they're just trying to um, provide options, ways to get back into the site, um, to do other things. So, uh, so that's kind of a general group here. Um, so this webinar, yes, is for kind of the beginner level, but, uh, so yeah, so these are some technical terms. Hopefully I'm breaking them down enough where it makes sense for the average person, but, um, but yeah, so here, here's the way that sites are typically attacked. 
so 51% of all hacks are due to a WordPress site being outdated. So this means you need to update WordPress, you need to update themes, you need to update plugins. Um, most, uh, as it says here, 92% of all <clears throat> uh, WordPress sites that are hacked due to something being outdated is because of a plugin. So chances are that's your most likely avenue to have your site hacked. Um, it's pretty pretty small actually with WordPress core that you know it's tested you know <laughs> what is it like 47 percent of the web now uses it. So obviously if there's a security issue, those get reported and taken care of quickly. But with plugins, you know you have authors that not as much exposure. Um, and so things slip through the cracks a lot, not as much code review, that kind of stuff. Um, so outside of that group of things that happens because you don't update, uh, another 41% of attacks are caused by a vulnerability at the web hosting level. So this is where it kind of gets a little bit out of your control outside of the fact that, um, you know, you've got a... Uh, yeah, someone just pointed out, I, I don't think these add up to 100%. That's, there are other reasons, but, you know, there's always the long tail of, of things that don't quite make the list. Um, <clears throat> and there's about 8% uh, of the sites that are hacked due to weak passwords. So this is the situation where one of those brute force attacks where somebody's trying to guess your password and is running a script to do that um, actually succeeds. So. <clears throat> um, yeah, so there are some security plugins, and we'll talk a little bit about those here in a bit. Um, so, yeah, we'll talk a little bit too about uh, specific things that you should look for in plugins. But typically, if a plugin hasn't been updated in, say, six months, um, it's, you know, now granted, I've got plugins that haven't been updated in six years and they're still just secure and, and work just as well as they did. Um, <laughs> six years ago. Um, but so it, it, it kind of varies. But generally, if you're seeing a site or a plugin that's getting updated on a regular basis, every three to six months is reasonable. Um, ideally, every time a new WordPress plugin comes out, there would be an update to the, uh, maybe not to the plugin, but to the, uh, you know, on WordPress, it tells you, you know, this plugin is compatible with X. Um, and you want to look at the ratings and make sure the ratings are good because if it has like a one star rating, it's probably not uh, a great plugin. Um, and you kind of want to look too at the support level. Uh, so somebody who's actively supporting a plugin um, is more likely to be responsive if there's some sort of security problem. Um, but you know, none of that is truly going to prevent security issues, but um, it's definitely good signs, good signals to pay attention to. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, so this just stating a fact here that most hacking attempts are actually automated. Um, so it's not like somebody's really just sitting down at a computer and trying things. Um, you know, people do that, I'm sure. Uh, people who are just learning, <laughs> learning that kind of thing. But um, yeah, mo most of most people are coders and they write programs and they run those uh, and attempt to hack sites. Um, although I do know a couple of people who are like hobbyist hackers, I guess. Um, so one person I know you would go into e-commerce sites, uh, various e-commerce sites, um, and they would uh, attempt to change the price on the page and see if it would submit with that price. And in some cases it would, so they got some really good deals. Um, but uh, but yeah, so that's kind of interesting. So we're gonna talk more about some of these mitigation strategies, ways that you can kind of avoid a lot of these issues. Um, <clears throat> so number one, backups are critical. Obviously, if your site gets hacked and you don't have a backup, you're kind of screwed, right? You have to, you know, yeah, you could lose data, you could lose files. Uh, if you don't have those backed up, then all of that's gone. Um, <clears throat> in some cases, you know, some of the attacks are actually ransomware, right? Like I've had um, 
I've had someone hack into a site that um, was built. Uh, and this one has, actually wasn't directly read to WordPress, but uh, um, when they hacked in, they basically downloaded the database and then wiped it and then demanded Bitcoin to get that database back. So part of the, uh, you know, attack in some cases is to steal the data and then make you pay to get it back. So if you have a backup, you know, you don't necessarily have to pay that, right? You can fix the issue and move on with the data that you have. Um, but obviously you do want to kind of be aware that someone else has that data and you do need to deal with that in some way, ideally. Uh, but yeah, so we're going to talk a little bit about how do we mitigate these brute force attacks where somebody's trying to guess our um, passwords. Um, but yeah, we have a question, what's the best method of backing up sites? Um, there's some good plugins out there. Um, Updraft Plus is a good plugin. And I say that just because it's the only free plugin that allows you to back up to a third-party source on a regular scheduled automated basis. Um, and all of those things are important. You want to make sure you're backing up offsite because if your backups are on your site and it gets hacked, all those can be wiped as well. So if it's not offsite, um, it's really not going to be any good. So, uh, but there's plugins like Backup Buddy and Jetpack has a uh, vault press and there's a bunch of different options out there. <clears throat> um, but yeah, so just because you have a backup doesn't mean that you're good to go. Uh, obviously, if your site gets hacked, you have to deal with how they got in. And of course, your backup is going to be, you know, just as vulnerable as it was originally. But um, but it's important to, to realize that, uh, you know, there's kind of this balance between getting a site back up and then actually... Um, you know, fixing the hack, right? So like if your site's making millions of dollars and then all of a sudden, you know, it's got to be down for 48 hours while someone figures out exactly what happened, um, you know, that's probably not acceptable. So having the backup allows you to get your site up quickly. Typically what I'll do if there's a, a site hacked and someone's like, just get it up, um, I'll back up the hacked site so that I have something to work from to figure out you know, what did they, what files did they put there? What does that code do? How does that work? Um, and then I'll restore the site. And then of course I'll do any updates that might need to be done because we know that's a, a big issue. Um, might reach out to my web post and see, you know, how they might've got in. Cause again, that was another big one. Um, and then, you know, maybe putting in some things in place to prevent these brute force attacks, maybe just use a more secure password. Um, but, but yeah, so here's a few things to keep in mind. Uh, number one, if you use a password manager, you're more likely to have more secure and longer passwords. Uh, so definitely recommend that, especially for me and my profession where I end up having logins to lots of different things. It's nice to be able to have that in a, in a manageable way where I can click you know, I use one password to log in and I can click and it just logs me in. Um, and I don't have to remember, you know, 5,050 character passwords. Um, but the longer your password is, um, the more secure it is against brute force attacks. So I think that, uh, I don't remember the exact statistics here, but uh, I believe something like if you have an eight character password, um, Brute force attack could guess it in about five minutes. But if you have like a 10 character password that increases to like a year or something like that. Um, so obviously if you have like a 50 character password, you've extended that time frame significantly, especially if it's all completely random and it doesn't use like words from the dictionary, stuff like that. So um, LastPass is a standalone uh, application. They have like a Chrome extension. Um, uh, Firefox extension, um, things like that, they, a, a mobile app. Um, so that'll basically allow you when you're working, you know, in the browser and you pull up a site, it it can autofill your password for that thing. Um, but, you know, it only works in that browser when you're logged in to that uh, password manager tool. So, so yeah, so that is a, a great way of 
making sure that things from a password standpoint um, are manageable. Um, and again, you know, we mentioned the longer the password, the more secure it is. But the other thing is, if your password were ever to be guessed, then someone has access to your account. And usually it's an admin account, right? So if you enable two-factor authentication for a um, for an admin account, then you basically, you know, once they guess the password, they, they don't have access to your mobile device or whatever um, you've set up for authentication. Um, so they won't, they still won't be able to get in or get access. So two-factor authentication is huge in terms of, of that. You probably don't want to enable it for everybody. Um, just because somebody can get in as a subscriber, they can't really do much in WordPress. But if you're an admin, you can upload plugins, which means I can create a plugin that does whatever I want and I can upload it onto your site. Um, so it's very important to uh, keep, uh, keep things secure in that way. <clears throat> so, um, and again, if you're running like an e-commerce site, you don't want to have two-factor authentication enabled because if you do that for all your customers, it can be very confusing. Uh, but again, you know, there's only a handful of things that someone who hacked that particular user could do um, as opposed to an admin. So the important thing is that admins have the two-factor enabled. Um, <clears throat> so then trying to make sure that, um, yeah, so Google password, um, that's another good password tool, you know, uh, should be safe to use. Um, yeah, so on the limiting login attempts, uh, so there's a plugin called Log Limit Login Attempts Reloaded. So there's another plugin that used to do this, but uh, this is kind of a newer, more modern, uh, updated version. And basically what it'll do is it'll, it'll start to monitor when people are hitting your login screen. And they will, um, you know, if it realizes that those requests are coming from the same place and they hit a certain number of attempts, it'll basically lock that person out from being able to do any more attempted logins. So if somebody is running a script and it's coming from the same IP address, then, you know, it would, it would detect that. And then, you know, after like four guesses, it would say, sorry, you got to wait an hour before you can continue. So something like that, that slows the person down from being able to do guesses, extends the brute force attack from, you know, potentially minutes to a year to 10 years to, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, let's see. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think WordFence has a lot of the things that we're talking about, about built in. Um, some people don't, some people think WordFence is a little too much. So providing some options here as far as like specific plugins that do specific things. Um, so a good number of limits. So really, if you like for the average person, if you're typing in a password and you, it doesn't work, uh, you might try again and then you're like, okay, I really need to look up my password. And then you give it a third try. Um, and then maybe just for good measure, you could give them a fourth try. But, uh, you know, if you, you know, typically I, I think, uh, this plugin may attempt uh, may uh, default to something like four, three or four or something like that. Um, you can change it. Um, you know, if you, if you feel like you need five, just in case uh, you, so you don't get locked out of your own site, just if you mistype things a lot or something. Um, but yeah, it is, it is within a, a particular time frame. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, mitigating the DDoS attacks. So this is where someone's just trying to overwhelm your, uh, server with all of these um, requests. So, and this is where, um, again, you know, we got plugins like WordFence and Security and Cloudflare, which is not a plugin, but it's a, you know, it's a service that, uh, it, it's basically a layer between people coming to your site and actually getting to your site. Um, so it, it provides kind of an application firewall uh, that can stop people before they even get to your site. Right. So when um, 
I mean, WordFence and security, they're plugins. So the requests actually have to come to the site before they can be handled. Um, so WordPress is actually handling the blocking of those requests, even though they've already hit WordPress. Um, whereas something like Cloudflare is before they even hit your site, Cloudflare can block a request and it doesn't even make it, doesn't even load up WordPress. So, um, so something to be aware of when you're trying to maybe determine if you want to use a plugin to do some of these things or a service that, you know, isn't a plugin. To a certain degree, the more code that you're running on your site, the more likely it is that it could be hacked. Um, so even WordFence and Security aren't completely, um, you know, safe when it comes to security. They're, they could have a, a security issue in the security plugin. Um, and since it's running on the site, there's a chance that, you know, you could still have an issue. Uh, typically, you know, <laughs> the security companies like WordFence and Security and uh, I think iTheme Security and uh, Security and some other things, they they do a good job. They obviously know what they're doing. So uh, you can typically trust them, but there, there are chances that things can happen. Um, yeah, so the question is, it seems like I need security on my computer and security on my website. Is that correct? Yeah, so yeah, that's one thing I don't have in my slide deck, but is important to realize is that if your computer gets infected, <clears throat> your website login information, for example, could get leaked along with whatever other data they might be stealing from your computer. Um, so it's very possible that if your computer has been infected with some sort of virus, that it could give them what they need to access your site. So making sure that you keep your computer secure using some sort of, um, you know, antivirus security software uh, is definitely a good thing. So um, I'm kind of grouping everything else under other attacks because um, some of them you have to utilize those things together to get in. And so, you know, it, it, there's a there's a big group of things here, but there's a few things we can do to kind of mitigate some of these other broader, uh, broader things. So let's see here. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so obviously, as we've mentioned already, keeping up with updates is probably one of the biggest and most important things you can do, because again, it is about 51% of all um, uh, attacks is from a plugin that's on the site that's insecure. So <clears throat> keeping those things updated, typically will mean that those will be secure. Um, not always. Uh, sometimes there are security issues with the latest version of a plugin. Um, and then, you know, some of the security plugins will let you know, like, hey, we are aware that the security vulnerability with this plugin, if you update, it'll fix it. And sometimes there is no update to fix it. Uh, and maybe sometimes the, the best option is to find a new plugin that does the same thing. Um, that is secure. Um, is it more secure, question here, to log into the site's dashboard through the web host or through the admin? Um, I don't think there's a real benefit to necessarily doing one over the other. Um, typically, if you go through the web host, you get the you know one-click login button, um, but it's basically running through the same code as when you log in on the WordPress login page. So I don't think there's a big, big difference there. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so the other big thing is obviously if plugins are the primary vector that people get to your site and hack it, is we wanna make sure that uh, we use some sort of reputable plugin, right? So wanna make sure that the source that you download from is safe. So don't just Google something and then when there's a free plugin that shows up, download it. Now, if it's obviously on WordPress.org in the plugin, the official plugin directory, uh, it should be safe because they do, um, well, should be keyword. Uh, they do some checks on that. Um, and then obviously if you're working or if you're, if you found a plugin and it's a company that offers it, 
you know, do your due diligence, find other people who are using it, make sure that they're, you know, a decent uh, company or person who's written it. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> so the other thing is we want to keep our licenses updated. So if you are using some sort of premium plugin, if your license lapses, that also means that your plugin is no longer going to be able to check for or receive updates. <clears throat> well, it may still be able to check for them, but it, it won't update, which means you may not get the latest security updates, which means your plugin then could be vulnerable. So important to make sure that you have up-to-date licenses so that you have up-to-date plugin um, and so on. So again, uh, premium plugins, sometimes they don't get as much usage um, and may actually be more susceptible to the tax. So um, using WordPress host is going to make a big difference. Again, we mentioned that, uh, was it 41% or something like that of all sites are hacked because of the web host. So if you're using a host that doesn't understand WordPress, chances are they don't have those WordPress specific firewall rules or other things that are going to protect your WordPress site. So important to, to find a good WordPress host. Um, and ideally, you know, uh, uh, well, WordPress does have a recommendations page where they recommend hosting. I think it's wordpress.org slash hosting um, or recommended hosting. I can't remember. Um, I do have a link at the end of this slide deck uh, for that. I will, <clears throat> before I wrap this up, I will post the slide link in the uh, chat here. Uh, the other thing is we want to make sure that we keep PHP up to date. If you don't know what PHP is, it's basically the programming language that WordPress uses and, and runs on. Um, so if it's out of date, obviously, uh, it can cause security issues. Uh, ideally, this is something your web host handles, but some web hosts give you the ability to run older versions. Um, now, typically, those older versions, they web hosts do actually maintain security patches and things for them. Uh, but there will come a time where, um, you know, you might be running an older version is no longer patched. And if you don't update it, um, you know, that's a problem. Uh, some hosts will do this for you. Some hosts leave it to you. Uh, so you just need to be aware of kind of what your web host's policy is and, and what you might need to do to take care of that. Uh, typically, if you have something like a VPS service, if you don't know how to maintain a server, you should probably go back to uh, manage WordPress hosting or shared WordPress hosting or something like that, where all that's just taken care of for you. <clears throat> uh, let's see here. So, yeah, so some of the more advanced strategies here. I didn't skip anything. Yeah. Um, so, file permissions is one big thing that um, that can be an issue. Uh, again, this is more of a developer thing, uh, but some hosts do give you tools where you can just click a button and it'll reset the file permissions. So, if somehow things got off, um, then I, I think I have a slide about this here. Yeah, there we go. Um, so <clears throat> yeah, if, if your file permissions are too loose, it actually means that people outside of people who should be able to <laughs> can actually change files on your system. So it can be a decent, uh, you know, if not configured correctly, it can be a big uh, vulnerability um, waiting waiting to have your site hacked. Um, so disabling PHP execution, um, this is again, a developer focused thing, but um, you know, WordPress doesn't, you know, when you upload a file into WordPress, it goes into the uploads folder and no code really should end up in the uploads folder. Um, but if it does, right, so like, Maybe you run a website where people can upload photos and share them with each other or something like that. But what happens if somebody uploads a PHP file and it goes up onto the server and then they have the ability to go to that URL and load that page? Well, you've got a security issue, right? So good web hosts um, will block uh, execution of PHP in these types of folders. Um, but 
if they don't, there are ways that you can do that yourself, depending on the uh, uh, options that the host gives you. So something just to be aware of. Another one here is uh, disabling the file editor in WordPress. So by default, if you're an admin and you log into WordPress, um, you can actually change, um, I'm sorry, you can actually go into the theme editor or the plugin editor and it'll let you edit the code inside of your themes and plugins. Um, so obviously this is, well, it's a bad practice in general, just because if you know how to change the code, you really probably shouldn't be doing it there. Um, and if, um, you know, somebody's telling you to paste code in there for some reason, that's also a bad idea because hopefully you trust the source that's telling you to paste it, but it's just another op opportunity where it can get abused. So in the WP config file, there's a disallow file edit constant that you can set, which will turn that off. And I think some hosts turn that off, some hosts don't, uh, but it's definitely worth uh, worth turning off. <clears throat> uh, the other thing is disabling XML RPC. Uh, this is not really something that people use anymore. I think there might be a small handful, probably less than a handful of things that um, still use it. I think Jetpack uses it to some degree, but um, depending on what features you enable. But <clears throat> um, but this actually, the XML RPC, it actually allows someone to send hundreds of password guesses, essentially, uh, to the site at once, which means that it can be a significant problem um, because instead of getting one guess uh, each page load, now we get a hundred or a thousand or whatever it is, um, you know, they'll find out your password a lot quicker. So it's a good thing to turn this off. Uh, another one, this is a little bit more interesting. Again, uh, it used to be everybody by default, WordPress gave you uh, your initial user uh, username was admin. Right, so you'd log in with admin and whatever your password was, <clears throat> and so it's important not to use admin because you know people still still use that, or you know it, it's not a default in WordPress anymore to have admin be the default username. Um, I don't think they give you a default anymore, but um, but if you type it in, you know it's it's a hacker's number one guess, right? of what your username is. Um, and because it says admin, chances are if you hack into it, you get admin access. So um, some people actually create an admin user that's just a subscriber and then create their admin user just to fake people out. Um, but <clears throat> WordPress also does have the REST API. And if you're not familiar, uh, the REST API can actually return all of the users. Um, and so it provides usernames for people to try to run their attacks against. So on a lot of sites that I work with, I actually turn off the user endpoint for people who don't have, you know, logged in access to the REST API. Um, so, uh, oh yeah, so somebody's asking, my host recently discontinued HT access use. Is this because of security vulnerabilities? No, uh, a lot of sites, basically HT access is only used on servers that run Apache, which is a specific software that runs on the server and serves up your web pages. Um, so Apache and Nginx are kind of the two big ones. And Nginx doesn't use HT access and Apache does. And um, hosts have different configurations, but Nginx has tended to be faster in many cases. Uh, so basically they've, they've updated things to be faster, but it also doesn't allow you to use HD access. So, um, just something to be aware of, uh, but some hosts do use Apache and have other ways of speeding things up, uh, because they want to keep that HD access just because that's kind of the traditional way the WordPress is giving you, uh, ways of working with, you know, creating rules and security rules and different things. Uh, let's see. So <clears throat> the other big one here is you can actually change your MySQL table prefix. So if you're not familiar, MySQL is the um, 
so the database that you have in WordPress is run on MySQL. Uh, and so by default, all of the tables that store your data in WordPress have a prefix. And WordPress defaults that prefix to be WP underscore. So for example, if you look in the database, you would see WP underscore options, which is where all of your sites, options, plugin options, all those things end up. Uh, so if somebody was wanting to, say, grab some of that data out of that table, they would probably be guessing, you know, kind of shooting in the dark and saying, well, chances are this table's name WP underscore options. But if you change the prefix to something like T34X underscore, then it's very unlikely that anybody's going to guess that. So it tends to make things a bit more secure. <clears throat> um, the WP config file is a file in WordPress that stores, you know, a lot of kind of the setup code and things that happen, but it stores um, your database information and um, your security keys and different things, uh, all sorts. Uh, so <clears throat> obviously if somebody gets access to that file, it can be a bad thing because you're giving up basically the data that <laughs> allows WordPress to have all the access it needs to do its thing. Um, so you can actually move that file up a directory, which should normally put it outside of the publicly accessible uh, area of your site, meaning you can't go to a URL and actually hit that file. Um, so that is one way of kind of making sure that those things are a bit more safe. Another another option, and again, this is just one example of a plugin that does this, but uh, you can actually move your login page. Again, if you're dealing with brute force attack situation, you can actually use this plugin and change your um, change your login page. So you could say, you know, instead of going to WP admin uh, or slash WP dash login, uh, you can make it go to um, I love cats, uh, <laughs> whatever you want to change it to. Um, so that kind of makes it a lot more difficult too, because now someone has to try to figure out where your login page is and chances are, well, so just a little background. I used to, um, I took a executive protection training course, which is essentially a bodyguarding class. And the, the interesting thing that they tell you about security is that, you know, when you're protecting someone else, your goal is not to um, keep them perfectly safe. Your goal is to make them hard enough to get at that the person who would otherwise be the attacker would go somewhere else, right? So that's essentially the idea with a lot of this. You're never going to be 100% safe, but if you can do these things that make it hard for people to you know, run their automated scripts or figure out where to run their scripts or all those kinds of things, then chances are they're just going to move on. So that's what you want. <clears throat> so again, WordPress actually advertises its own WordPress version in the code, and that's visible to anybody who wants to look at it in the browser. Um, so by hiding that, uh, there's a lot of plugins that will do this. I think even Yoast SEO gives you a way of removing the WordPress version, but a lot of security plugins do too. Um, but you can actually remove the WordPress version so that it's not obvious uh, if you're running an older version that maybe has a particular security vulnerability, uh, that kind of thing. And then again, um, from a code standpoint, we want to make sure that we sanitize, validate, and escape. So sanitization and validation is cleaning up things that are put into web forms and stuff like that. And then escaping is making sure that if you're pulling something from the database, that you're making sure you make it safe before you display it on the page. So if somebody were to do SQL injection and inject some sort of malicious code into your database, when you go to display a particular value, even if it had the malicious code, it wouldn't show, which would prevent uh, users from getting particularly malicious code that could impact the safety of their data. Um, so does changing questions, catching up here on questions. Um, 
can I change a live site's uh, table prefix? Yes, you can. Um, the There's just two things you have to do. A, change all the table prefixes in the database. B, make sure you update your WP config to contain that new table prefix. I think there are plugins actually that'll even help you do that. I would have to look, but I thought I recall seeing some that did that. Um, does changing the SQL table prefix mess up plugins that might access it? So poorly written plugins will assume often that your database tables are WP underscore something. Um, those plugins are plugins I would recommend you stay away from. So by changing your database prefix, if plugins break, you're probably better off not using them. It is possible that they'll break, but only because they're poorly written. So um, a well-written plugin will use the correct WordPress standards, and then it will automatically use the correct database tables. Um, if you have a login button on your site, then moving the login page does not work, right? Um, Right, yeah. So if you if you have a login button and it takes you to a login page, even if you change the the URL for that, if your button takes them there, it's kind of kind of productive. Um, <clears throat> so let's see. What did you say the escape mitigation is? I'm not sure what you mean by oh oh this here. Okay, yeah. So escaping is basically making sure that whatever's in your database is cleaned up before you display it on your website. Uh, because if you have malicious code in your database somehow and you go to display it, it may actually run code that can trick users into giving up data or things like that. Uh, would buying SiteLock take care of all of these efforts for me? I think any solution is probably not going to take care of everything. Um, some of these things are like manual things that you might want to do to better secure your site. So tools like SiteLock aren't necessarily going to do some of those things, but um, but they will, you know, they they will do a significant amount. Um, but I feel like you can't just rely on a single tool uh, for for this. You do have to kind of combine some of these things together. Um, and again, talking about standards, <clears throat> even if you're not a coder, if you have a theme which often um, themes may not have the bit greatest code. There are, there's a lot of times there's designers that uh, learned code and put those together, but um, you can actually use a plugin called theme check and it will scan the theme for anything that may be off from the WordPress standards. So themes that go into the wordpress.org theme directory will actually have to go through this theme check before they can make it up there. So um, it's a good way of just kind of screen testing, especially if you're in the stage of choosing a theme. Uh, it's good to, you know, grab a few themes, run them through the checker, you know, maybe use the one that has the least issues. <laughs> and, and, you know, you could also reach out and say, hey, to the theme author, these things I've run into, and they may take care of them or they may not. And again, that's part of just making sure you get good support with whatever you use too. So, um, <clears throat> and then for the coders out there, there are the uh, WordPress coding standards. And if you can use that while you're writing your code, uh, the coding standards can actually guide you to uh, places where you're not properly escaping or sanitizing or uh, using nonces or all kinds of things. So, Highly recommend um, if you're a coder, checking that out and using it. It's also like having a mentor over your shoulder while you're writing code. So it's a great way to learn too. <clears throat> um, also just being aware of who's on your site and what they're doing is important. So there's some plugins out there that'll allow you to kind of audit and keep track of uh, activity on your site. So if your site does get hacked, you can kind of, look back and say, well, you know, there's some suspicious activity here. Maybe we need to look into it and see what's going on there. Um, activity you wouldn't normally be able to see uh, if you didn't have one of these plugins installed before something happens. So 
stream uh, is a nice one. Simple history and WP activity log all kind of do the same thing. And um, so definitely recommend that. Even if you don't use it for security purposes, I highly recommend it for troubleshooting purposes. Uh, so it'll tell you if someone updated a plugin and if something broke after that, you can know that it was probably because they updated that plugin. Uh, so things like that, it's also useful for. Yeah, so here's a long list of resources. Um, and I will try to grab a, <clears throat> grab a link to this um, slide deck and throw it in here as well. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. Um, audit trails and privacy policy, I would say uh, you definitely <clears throat> probably will need to take that into account when you're crafting your privacy policy. Um, so yeah, that's probably a good point thing to keep in mind. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I wouldn't recommend using multiple security plugins if you have just one good security plugin. You should be good. Um, so, yeah, doubling up on the plugins that do the same thing actually commonly, very commonly causes issues. So, let me grab, um, let me, well, got too many screens up in here. I'm trying to get to the browser so I can grab this slide link here. All right. So, here we are. Yeah, so here is the link for the slide deck. Yep. And if anybody has any other questions, we can answer those. If not, then I think we've got about five minutes left. Yep, thank you. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, What's what the options are for grabbing all the links out of the chat and posting them maybe on like the meetup event page or something like that. Um, but yeah, I think I think there are a number of the links are in the last page of the slide deck here if you've got that. Um, but we'll see what we can do about the about the the other links that were posted here. <clears throat> So yeah, just another quick question about headless WordPress, security concerns with that. Um, <clears throat> if you do it right, there's probably less security concerns there. Um, although there's, I mean, there's still a significant number. Uh, it just depends <laughs> on your implementation, I guess. Uh, typically you'll lock down all of the front end of WordPress, but you still have a back end login so you can manage your data. And you just use WordPress for the REST API. Um, so it takes away a lot of the potential opportunities. And then, you know, when you're generating a static site, there's a lot less that can be hacked there. So it's typically more secure, um, but still a number of things you have to be concerned about. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the source of the stats, to be honest, um, there are are a number of places I found these stats, but I could never find the exact source, but they seem to match from the different places I did find them. So, <laughs> um, and some of them were for presentations from actually uh, Adam Warner back when he worked at SiteLock actually had a lot of those stats uh, as well. So they may be a little outdated, but uh, I feel like they're pretty accurate based off of what I was finding. Um, Let's see. Is there a tool or plugin you found is better for managing several sites? Um, so there's Blog Vault, which is an it's a service, but also a plugin. And it is really great because it will actually do daily security scans and automate, they have automated ways of repairing sites if they detect malware. Uh, so that would be a good place to look. 
Um, they also make it easy for you to handle updates on a regular basis on multiple sites all at once and to do visual regression testing, which is where they do a visual snapshot of the site before and after so that it's easy for them to flag and say, hey, this site may have issues you need to look at. Um, so that's that's a good place to look. Uh, blog vault. Um, yeah, so I'll type it in the chat here just so we have it in the in the um, chat. <clears throat> they actually have, go under multiple names, uh, Malcare, Blog Vault, Remote WP. Um, <clears> That's <throat> all basically the same service. All right. Well, I think that wraps us up. Anything we do to, need to do to close out here? Thank you very much, Micah, and everyone else. Um, I will go ahead and end the meeting for us. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing all your knowledge. All right. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Cheers, everybody.